Chapter 8, Risk Management, The Bridge Between Security and Resilience. Quote, time is what determines security. With enough time, nothing is unhackable, unquote. Anarchy Ezekiel. There's a lot of confusion between security, risk management, and resilience. These terms are often used interchangeably, creating confusion. The concepts are related, but distinctly different. Security is the act of protecting something. Resiliency is the ability to recover from disruption. Risk management bridges the two by managing all the security efforts by using intelligence, tools, and people to create a strategy and protect the entire supply chain. In the process, this increases operational resilience. Doing effective risk management is hard. It requires a wide-ranging set of capabilities and an understanding of the pitfalls. When's the best time to rob a bank? Bank robber extraordinaire Daniel Blanchard answered this question on a Saturday morning in May of 2004 when he walked up to a branch of the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce and stole nearly half a million dollars in cash. The money was delivered to the bank hours earlier in preparation for a Monday grand opening. Blanchard developed a very thorough and precise robbery technique that included doing significant amounts of surveillance during the construction process. Quote, as the bank was being built, Blanchard frequently sneaked inside disguised as a delivery person or construction worker. That allowed Blanchard to plant various surveillance devices in the ATM room. He knew when the cash machines were installed and what kind of locks they had. He had ordered the same locks online and reverse engineered them at home, unquote. Armed with this intelligence, he was able to rob the ATMs and leave the crime scene so intact that when the Winnipeg Police Service showed up, eight minutes after the alarm sounded, they concluded that it was a false alarm. As a further cautionary tale, Blanchard had installed his own surveillance equipment inside the bank, allowing him to listen in as investigators conducted their investigation. Then he pretended to be an anonymous tipster and submitted bogus leads to keep detectives off his trail. This crime would have been unsolved had it not been for a Walmart associate. Walmart and the bank shared the same parking lot. Who noted the license plate of Blanchard's minivan and gave it to the police. They eventually caught him. Blanchard's successful robbery demonstrated exquisite use of intelligence, tools, and people. He highlighted some serious physical security flaws. He described showing up to the bank construction site, quote, in broad daylight, disguised as a delivery person or construction worker, Sometimes it was just a matter of donning a yellow hard hat from Home Depot. He procured and stockpiled IDs and uniforms from various security companies and even law enforcement agencies, unquote. The bank robber also identified some serious operational design flaws. Through his unfettered intelligence gathering, he deduced that security is more lax before the money shows up. Security during construction is focused on preventing materials from being stolen from the site rather than restricting access. He also realized that many banks use Moss Hamilton or Lagarde locks. Naturally, Blanchard acquired his own, teaching himself to assemble and disassemble them in 40 seconds. This story shines a light on the weakness of physical security. Interestingly, I have driven up to a client's physical security barrier and noted that I'm here to see Brian Smith, the name of my client. That's all it takes to get into the facility. I couldn't pick a more generic name. It's almost too obvious. What's more concerning is that in a sleep-deprived state, I once gave the wrong name, John Smith, and the barrier opened without so much as a second glance from security. In Blanchard's example, we also discover how easy it is to access a building with only a uniform. What authority does a UPS or FedEx uniform convey? How often do we simply look past the hundreds of Uber, Lyft, DoorDash delivery folks making their way in and out of corporate campuses? How many buildings can I get into by simply donning an Amazon vest available for $20 on eBay? Blanchard didn't just hack a few Canadian banks. He hacked the entire ATM supply chain, not to mention parts of the police investigations. He developed a comprehensive and sophisticated understanding of the process, operations, technology, and security surrounding the building and deployment of banks and ATMs. Had he not been caught by a fluke, there's no telling how many more banks he would have robbed. My presumption is that the ATM supply chain was vastly overhauled once Blanchard's crimes were exposed. But what can we learn from this? First, it is the perfect example of using identity theft protection. 
This robbery occurred because of Blanchard's intelligence collection. Second, Blanchard made exceptional use of tools, locks, outfits, surveillance equipment. Finally, the people in charge of protection made a whole series of assumptions, what security guards were or were not protecting, that locks will keep people out, that physical security was sufficient, all of which Blanchard exploited. Taken together, the story illustrated the need to understand when and where risk is likely to occur and who is likely to exploit it. In the Blanchard theft case, the best time to rob the bank was before the money entered the facility. While the actual robbery occurred, of course, after the money entered the facility, almost everything to make the robbery successful happened before removing the money. Prevailing security best practices did not account for identifying nor disrupting intelligence gathering. Renowned diplomatic security expert and author Fred Burton explains that much of diplomatic security focuses on bad actors' disruption of surveillance and intelligence activities. This is when nefarious characters are most vulnerable. If you can spot these activities, you can prevent or disrupt the attack before it occurs. The same is true for protecting supply chains. We have to understand when our supply chains are being surveilled. Once a bad actor gathers crucial information about a vulnerability, they can apply it against your enterprise. If that doesn't work, they can try it against your Tier 1 supplier. If that doesn't work, they can try it against your Tier 2 supplier. And on down the supply chain. If you go deep enough, you will find a vulnerability, whether physical or digital. This is the crucial flaw of focusing on risk during the supplier onboarding phase. Risk is likely introduced long after the contract is signed. Armed with this knowledge, we need to take a harder look at shoring up both physical and digital security. A quick search on YouTube will show some very concerning results about all aspects of corporate physical security. The Modern Rogue channel has a video in which they partnered with Red Team Alliance Security Group to illustrate how to bypass radio frequency identification badge readers. That's right, there's a YouTube video, several in fact, that showed just how useless the badge readers are. For a couple hundred dollars and perhaps a construction vest, nearly any corporate ID badge checker can be opened with two screws and a small electronic device dropped in that will capture the code of each badge scanned. It's shocking how easily you can then clone badges. Even worse, the badge access of all employees can be tracked to determine when the building is likely to be empty. Every enterprise that uses electronic ID badges has a massive security vulnerability waiting to be exploited. And even if your company doesn't have this vulnerability, chances are nearly every third party you interact with does. Security guards and video cameras can help, but unless the guards are focused on this instead of dealing with building access or someone is intently watching the security camera, then physical security remains a huge risk. When is risk? Nearly all third party risk is concentrated at the onboarding phase. The bank robbery example perfectly explains the problem of looking at risk at the wrong time. When working with third parties, we need to stay on top of what the entity is doing and how we are working with them. And we need to be attentive to offboarding as well. With the bank robbery example, the security was lax before the cash arrived. However, the opposite is true when it comes to third parties. We tend to focus on onboarding and give minimal to no interaction at the offboarding phase. This is where not knowing the exact number of suppliers you are transacting with matters and why you need to remove all suppliers that you are not actively managing and tracking. For active suppliers, you need to be monitoring what activity they are conducting in your systems and interpreting it for untowardly behavior. This supplier intelligence can help you identify bad activity before it becomes a crisis. Keep in mind that your supplier may not know it has been compromised, so it is incumbent on you as the host system to be on top of anomalous behavior by your suppliers and third parties. I had a very senior government client proudly state that nearly all of their risk mitigation efforts occurred at the supplier onboarding phase. But once the supplier is part of procurement, no one gives them a second thought. This person was from a government entity responsible for physical systems that employ significant digital components. As a taxpayer, this is infuriating. But as a global citizen, it's even more concerning because these systems are used globally and malfunctioning can create crises. So clearly understanding the third-party activity and the individual components is paramount. Also, who is monitoring all the components that went into these systems and who is monitoring the third party and subsidiaries to ensure they are still secure? Intelligence. Risk visualization is basic. 
every enterprise has a bevy of risk illumination slash visualization slash signaling that functions as their left of boom activities. And most enterprise have a list of all the potential threat vectors showing what has happened or is happening. However, it's important to remember that none of this is risk intelligence or risk management. Risk visualization takes all kinds of data input and visualizes it. With a few exceptions, it does not analyze it. What could happen? Nor create intelligence, what we should do. For example, risk visualization tells us there's a ship stuck in the Suez Canal and what products are on it. Risk management is how we respond to the situation. And risk intelligence helps us prevent it from happening again. Or ideally, it informs us not to enter the canal in the first place. Intelligence is created with deep interrogation of previous disruptions. The event gave rise to a plethora of news stories, pundits, and analyst declarations about the ever given ship being stuck. But how many people lost interest after it was dislodged from the sandbank? Do we appreciate the significant dependence global shipping places on harbor pilots? What happens when harbor pilots are overworked, undertrained, or simply don't get along with one another? A closer look at what happened on that fateful day should send shudders through the global logistics industry. The subsequent trial revealed some serious and concerning operational weaknesses. Another problem with risk visualization is that the information is delayed because it takes time to collect and process the underlying data. Thus, risk visualization is not real time. So by the time the threat information makes its way to the business, it's not telling anybody anything they didn't already know. Risk tool software providers frequently reference a hurricane approaching to demonstrate the power of their tool, as if the tool detects the hurricane and will tell everyone about the impact. However, anybody who lives in the path of a hurricane already knows that a hurricane is coming and takes the necessary precautions, so the risk visualization tool does not really add any value. To put a finer point on this, imagine our earthquake hitting the San Francisco Bay Area. We don't need a tool to tell us an earthquake hit the region but we do need to know how our third parties are affected. The problem is that the crisis will be well underway if not resolved before the tool can get the relevant information and by then it's too late to be of use. Enterprise risk visualization tools are one of the most enigmatic genres of solution ever developed. They look immensely cool. The leading providers all have some combination of a map plotting risk areas, a list of threat types, and fancy charts denoting red, yellow, green statuses, all of which are usually set against a black background to maximize the wow factor. The more advanced solutions have pretty network maps, which no mortal has ever figured out how to interpret, and usually a mobile interface. This begs the question, how could something so pretty be so useless? The trouble with risk is that most significant threats come from the places where the data is hardest to find. As supply chains have become globalized, the closer you get to the source material and the earlier production phases, the less transparency there is. This can be the result of failed, failing, repressive governments, local oligarchies, bribery, fraud, language and literacy barriers, proximity to the supplier, or simply a lack of infrastructure. Risk is often introduced very deep in the supply chain long before there is data to track. So here's the question. Are you analyzing the data you have and ignoring the data you need? The last major issue with risk visualization platforms is information overload or the chicken little phenomenon. It's great that you can sign up for risk alerts, but how many alerts do you need to receive in a day before you realize that 99% of them are useless? This is usually followed by turning off the alerts. The reverse problem can be true as well, where the threat signal comes through after the event because the data processing takes so long. So the crucial question is, is anybody taking notice when there's a real threat? People. Humans are most of the problem. In cyber right now, it's all too easy to overwhelm systems, people, and technology with low-cost threats and overload systems into breaking. Consider every employee in your organization. Everything they do introduces a threat to your IT system. However, you'll have, let's hope, an IT organization that puts significant effort into securing your corporate network, which is good and was very relevant when most of your work was done at the office. Now that you work predominantly from home, you're introducing greater risk. Look around your house. How many devices are there? Each person has at least a laptop slash desktop computer and a smartphone. Then look at the number of IoT devices, baby monitors, security cameras, home control, internet-enabled toys, and televisions and you likely have at least one router serving all of these devices. 
How secure are those devices? Are they up to date on all their patches? How secure are the passwords? Do you know what the password is to your router? Did you know there are scenarios in which your router will reset the password back to password, assuming you changed it in the first place? Can a hacker drive by your house, crack your router, attack your IoT devices, and plant malware? A hacker can monitor your work laptop waiting for an unpatched vulnerability. When they find it, they will use your computer to attempt to fish credentials from your coworkers because the messages are coming from a trusted source. But now you are a compromised trusted source and you don't know it. So now I can social engineer my way up the food chain. If you don't believe me, just check out how easily one of the largest social media platforms was taken over. And tech companies are supposed to be good at cybersecurity. The Twitter Takeover In July of 2020, Twitter was taken down by a few clever phone calls and some smart social engineering. Teenagers Mason Shepard, Nima Fazeli, and Graham Ivan Clark managed to bypass all of Twitter's security and take control of dozens of high-profile accounts, including those belonging to Barack Obama, Bill Gates, and Joe Biden, and send fake messages soliciting money through a Bitcoin scam. All too often, digitally native companies are held up as the standard bearers for security and aspirational operations, and yet these vaunted Twitter employees readily, and presumably accidentally, gave over usernames and passwords to their internal systems. Just another reminder of how poorly governed these companies are when it comes to basic controls. Turns out all that speed to market, disruption, and general thumbing of noses to the status quo is still susceptible to human fallibility. Unsurprisingly, these hackers simply called their targets and spearfished them using false identities until they got access to an internal user administration tool. There were so many security breakdowns in this example, but ultimately came down to the hackers gathering intelligence about the people they called, including some brand new employees, in addition to knowing about the existence of the administration tool. Basic acting skills convinced the employees to turn over the requisite information. Wired senior writer Andy Greenberg described how easily an attack like this can happen. Quote, they ask the target to navigate to a fake login page and enter their credentials. Another member of the hacking group immediately obtains those details and enters them into the real login page. The real login page then prompts the victim to enter their two-factor authentication code. When the user is fooled into typing that code into the fake site, it is also relayed to the second hacker who enters it into the real login page allowing them to fully take over the account. That is the explanation of how this happened. Taking a more holistic view, this hack happened because security designers put a disproportionate amount of trust and responsibility on the weakest part, the humans. Tools, why I don't get excited about off-the-shelf risk solutions. There are many ways to approach employing a risk management solution. Typically, companies build a bespoke solution in-house or buy single domain solutions and or a risk platform. The internally developed bespoke solution makes use of in-house or external consulting software and analytics resources and often includes some sort of web scraping, data direct feed integration, and internal data collection. This data is fed into an internal database, processed, and then visualized through some sort of tool such as Tableau or Power BI. The process can be operationally slow and limited to publicly available data. Many useful data sets require costly licenses. The analyses also lack the power of the network effect. The network effect pools assets, in this case data, across companies and creates synergies that benefit all participants that make use of the network. The resources engaged are rarely experts in suppliers, supply chains, or risk. This approach also commonly lacks anything beyond dashboard type capability. The other option is to buy off-the-shelf domain-specific risk providers. These solutions focus on a particular information domain and do it especially well. Some examples include financial risk, cyber risk, event risk, reputational risk, and so on. These providers supply deep coverage and analysis in their domain as they tend to acquire data directly from the source. These tools simply represent visualization of the data intelligence value chain. This is not bad, but it's neither risk intelligence nor management. The next level of evolution is the risk platform. Risk platforms acquire data directly from multiple individual data provider sources. This gives them broader coverage than domain-specific tools. The risk platforms often pay for and integrate key data subscriptions and split that fee across all clients, making it more cost-effective. 
they will also offer the option to integrate domain-specific risk providers to expand the level of coverage. This gives them a comprehensive set of risk signals. Armed with this array of data, the platforms can generate various risk scores and the associated charts and maps. For many enterprises, this is hugely beneficial, and even for the largest enterprises, this can be a great intermediary step. But despite the seemingly comprehensive view provided by a risk platform, there are limitations. These platforms don't cover industry-specific needs, for example, food safety, conflict minerals, commodity provenance. The risk scoring and modeling is a black box and usually not easily extensible or customizable. The functionality to manage and respond to risk is perfunctory, almost an afterthought, lacking the comprehensive robustness required to manage a crisis. Most importantly, integrating internal data sets can be a challenge not only because it requires sending valuable intellectual property outside the four walls, but also because of the unique nature of internal data sets. Ironically, this can be an unacceptable risk when it comes to customized formulations, recipes, and other such trade secrets. The biggest issue I have is that these tools do not enable risk analytics or the creation of risk intelligence. It is the latter that is crucially important. Take any macro disruption. The way it affects a telecom company will be far different than a CPG company, even though their target consumer is the same. This is because the raw materials, manufacturing, and logistic networks are totally different and have vastly different constraints, cost, supply, capacity, and so on. The intelligence that will help telecom companies avoid risk will be different than that for the CPG company. This is the nature of risk. The intelligence needs to be specific and unique, and it is hard, if not impossible, for a platform provider to economically produce this level of sophistication across industries or even for companies within the same industry. Corporate Risk Theater Corporations in the main, and I acknowledge I am making a very broad generalization here, engage in their own production of risk theater. The Senior Chief Information Officer at Ava Labs, J.M. Porup, identifies five examples of this. One, bad security awareness training. Porup argues it is a waste of time and makes people dismissive of legitimate security concerns. Two, complex passwords no one can remember. People keep using variations on the same password with different special characters or worse, posted on a sticky note, admittedly, something I have done more than once. Three, third-party questionnaires. These are good for establishing legal liability, but do nothing to make the organization more secure. Porup describes the forms as an exercise for third parties to demonstrate how much lying they can get away with. Four, checkbox compliance. You take action or buy software or a device because some best practice or governance group told you to. Again, this provides legal liability, but does nothing to protect against risk. As Porup extols his readers, emphasis added, Compliance is not security. Compliance is not security. Compliance is not security. Five, over-reliance on antivirus software. We are in a post-antivirus era. Experts across the board point out that antivirus tools were more useful for a period when software providers like Microsoft spent more time ignoring security threats instead of fixing them. Now, with better architected and auto-patching operating systems, the opportunity for viruses to do wide-scale exploitation is not nearly as fruitful to hackers. Using antivirus software is okay, but companies should not rely on it as a protection mechanism. Why not? The answer is simple. The weakness in digital systems is the humans who run them. These days, it's far easier to trick users into downloading an infected file or to respond to a phishing attempt, neither of which antivirus protects against. These pretty much sum up most enterprise risk theater, at least as applied to third parties. Porup says, quote, you cannot break security if you do not understand a system better than the people who made the system. And you cannot defend your organization if you do not understand how those systems work to the same degree, unquote. Is your risk management a performance too? If you have more than a thousand suppliers, take a bow. You're performing risk theater. No enterprise has enough resources to cope with more than this number. For argument's sake, let's say you have 30,000 suppliers. You are not managing 30,000 suppliers. 
it would be nearly impossible to manage this many external entities. Or to put it a different way, if you have 30,000 suppliers, you are not securing your supply chain vulnerabilities. This translates into extreme exposure risk for your operations. Whether it's a fraud, cyber vulnerabilities, or simply accidents, putting so many unmanaged entities into operational systems should send a shudder through every chief information security officer. Instead, you should consider moving 29,000 suppliers out of your systems into a solution that specializes in the management of third parties at scale. By doing this, you are creating a layered defense of your systems. Think of this solution as a tool you can use to increase security without over-reliance on people. However, you should still retain and collect the data from the third-party provider to incorporate it into your supply chain control tower and various intelligence modules. Once you move the many third parties out of the system, you can start to manage the remaining 1,000 suppliers. First, you must break down the 1,000 into two logical segments, the top 100 and the remaining 900, approximately. This allows you to use risk tools more effectively, and from there, you can build bespoke intelligence. People play an important role here. Like the Secret Service, they are the last line of defense. Therefore, you must train your people to think like hackers and create a culture of distrust. Note that I said distrust, not rudeness. There's a huge difference. Most enterprises are built to be positive and trusting. They trust that what the supplier represents in the RFP response is accurate. They trust the self-attestation of the supplier on risk and ESG surveys. And they trust that suppliers are who and what they state they are, and that employees review invoices properly and compare them against contracted terms and performance. Sadly, when it comes to people, there's reason to be concerned. Humans are fallible, so it's not surprising when companies like Volkswagen fake smog tests or individuals falsify quality tests for steel used in submarine hulls for the U.S. Navy. These are the decisions and actions of imperfect humans. Trust is good, but we must verify that no risk actually exists, that we aren't overpaying or that our suppliers aren't polluting on our behalf. The fact that enterprises don't have more disruptions can be attributed mostly to luck because the majority aren't verifying to the necessary level. If people are your first and last line of defense, you might simply be playing a part in corporate risk theater. The Miyagi-Do Approach to Risk Fans of Netflix's Cobra Kai series were treated to an important risk management concept in Season 5, Episode 7, entitled Bad Eggs. In this show, 12 students of the Miyagi-Do dojo are each asked to take an egg and protect it. The students take their eggs and scatter across the grounds in an attempt to keep each of their eggs safe. Their sensei, chosen Taguchi, goes one by one and smashes all the eggs in a series of increasingly entertaining ways. The students failed the lesson and are forced to do it again. The second time around, the students figure out that if they put all their eggs in a single basket and surround it, they can provide 360 degrees of protection. This time, as their sensei attacks, they can move, shift, and protect as a collective group, making them successful. In a highly disruptive and volatile world where the threats are ever-increasing, each enterprise attempting to protect itself alone will end up with its own broken egg. Case in point, let's say that Enterprise 1, Enterprise 2, and Enterprise 3 all use the same supplier, Sunrise IT. Each enterprise asks Sunrise to IT to fill out a security questionnaire. Of course, because Enterprises 1, 2, and 3 are all special flowers, they have different wording and questions on their form. Now Sunrise IT has to put resources into filling out all three surveys. Assuming Sunrise IT fills out each accurately, a dubious proposition, all three enterprises have to evaluate the responses, and that assumes they actually do that. Who from each enterprise is evaluating the survey response? What are they learning individually about Sunrise IT from the response? It would be far more effective for all three enterprises to use a single questionnaire, ideally collaboratively provided. This streamlines the process for Sunrise IT, and because there is less repetitive busy work, it's more likely it will provide comprehensive answers. Working with Sunrise IT collaboratively also creates a far more robust outcome in terms of data collected and understanding them. It allows for back and forth clarifications, learning, and greater sharing of information. Now imagine if we were 10, 20, or 30 enterprises. 
Think about it as a reverse supplier day, where instead of one enterprise inviting many suppliers to collaborate, you bring many enterprises together to work on the collective risk with a single supplier, in this case, Sunrise IT. Of course, you can't do this with 30,000 suppliers, only with your top 100. And there would undoubtedly be a vast number of legal and competitive hurdles to overcome. But the takeaway is that we need to work together across enterprises to do a better job at streamlining the task of the suppliers and enhancing the collective risk posture. Otherwise, we are all vulnerable. Make no mistake, no enterprise has enough money and technical resources to combat nation states. However, greater learning and sharing of information among the collective will vastly improve the collective security posture. The risk strategy we really need. As companies' risk management capabilities mature, there will come a time when they need to move away from a fixed strategy to a perpetual hacking approach. This gives us more flexibility to respond to known vulnerabilities while creating space to explore and identify unknown attacks. For example, one could identify that one of the biggest known threats to production is a demand shock, as we saw during the pandemic with toilet paper, sanitizing wipes, and PPE. By comparison, a category manager who is responsible for cocoa plantations in Sierra Leone probably knows what's happening on the individual farms they contract with. But do they know what's happening in the local, regional, national governments? Do they understand the logistics networks serving the farms or simply the surrounding infrastructure, roads, bridges, ports, and so on? It is this kind of risk extrapolation that will come to define tomorrow's risk management strategies. Quixotically, risk management is crucial to running an enterprise. But left unchecked, one can spend so much time and money on risk management that the very act becomes self-destructive. Thus, the right questions to ask are, should we treat all risks equally or should we prioritize some over others, say cyber over financial? Once we've identified and prioritized the relevant risks, we need to map what internal and external data we have, what data we need, and what data we don't know how to get. This will answer the question of whether we're analyzing the data we have or the data we need. Additionally, we need to apply the hacking mindset. We aim to collect as much data on third parties in our supply chain. Then we turn that data into intelligence. See figure seven, the data value chain on page 31. There are three keys to success. First, collecting data is easy, but you need to be able to rapidly call through the data to determine what is relevant and accurate and what isn't. This is where analytics tools can really help. As described in chapter three, intelligence data underpins everything. The second is to understand the actual risk. It is unrealistic to address every threat vector against every supplier. By prioritizing the impact on the business, we can focus on managing the risk that is most likely to impede operations. Whether it's a $10 capacitor from a fourth tier supplier or obtaining sufficient PPE, both of which can shut down a manufacturing line. By contrast, the biggest risk to a financial institution might be data exfiltration or vulnerability to ransomware through their systems integrator. Third, and perhaps most importantly, you must work to simplify the number of third parties. As you can see, the hacking approach is not a traditional strategy that gets created and executed, but rather a change to the company's DNA. How I would infiltrate your supply chain. Every supply chain is under attack these days. Many of these attacks fail and others go unreported. Then there are the high profile ones that splash into the news feeds, such as the recent attack on SpaceX. A ransomware gang claims to have hacked Maximum Industries, a Tier 1 supplier that fabricates rocket parts for the space company. The hackers threatened to post many of SpaceX's component drawings and internal operational documents for the world to see. To drive home just how vulnerable every supply chain is, I want to illustrate how straightforward it is. If I want to hack your supply chain, I would gather intelligence, figure out the best tools, and employ the necessary human capital. To start, I would decide whether I want to disrupt your operations, steal your specifications, redirect payments, or take control of your machines to wait for a future opportunity. For argument's sake, let's say I want to take control of your laptop so I can read your email documents and capture your passwords. One way to accomplish this is to spearfish you. However, I would have a higher probability of success by creating a fake company, say a contract manufacturer, I could use ChatGPT to generate a fake website offering a high-demand service, such as 3D printing. I would then create a fake LinkedIn profile, use a click farm to create thousands of connections, and create a fake executive team 
with pictures of people who do not exist. Then I could develop a few spec sheets with all of our capabilities and post them on a fake website. As an added measure of legitimacy, I would register on the supplier networks and buy Google AdWords so that when people search for a supplier to work with multi-wall polycarbonate acetyl sheet rod tubes and plexiglass, I pop up. I could even go a step further and purport to be a diverse supplier. The end game is getting you to download the spec sheets from my site. Once you do that, that would execute the ransomware. Your virus protection doesn't stand a chance. If I wanted to siphon off payments, I could simply buy a defunct business that had Fortune 500 companies as clients. The defunct company would likely be an approved supplier and in the enterprise payment system. What if I just started submitting invoices for work done? What are the odds that at least a portion of them would get paid? This is why we have to stop and reflect on where and when attacks can happen. Hacking Risk Management – 5 Takeaways 1. Good risk management improves your individual security and builds resilience. 2. Ask yourself when risk is likely to occur. 3. Don't forget about physical security. 4. Good acting is one of the biggest risks. 5. You can't manage more than a thousand suppliers. Otherwise, you are performing risk theater. <laughs>